And if we're good, you just let me know because I can no longer see you. We're good. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I'm happy and excited to be able to present to you guys today on one of my favorite topics, which is the FWC Exotic Pet Amnesty Program. So let me introduce myself. I am one of two biologists that participates in this program. We have a very small staff and we handle the Exotic Pet Amnesty Program for the entire state. So my role is non-native fish and wildlife education and outreach coordinator and our education and outreach specialist, another biologist, also assists with this. So our contact information will be given at the end of this presentation if you guys have any questions or any future needs that might involve this program. Before we talk about exotic pet amnesty, what it's meant to do, how it operates, I am very quickly gonna go through some background slides because it's important to tell the story of how this program came into existence and why. You guys already know, in fact, most of Florida already knows that non-native species are a challenge and an obstacle to overcome in wildlife management for our state. So if we look at this map, this is a collection of individual observation points from 1924 to the present, and each yellow dot indicates an animal that was observed that wasn't native to the state, not naturally occurring in our state, had to be introduced. So if you count all those up over those years, this map represents over 100,000 individual observations of non-native fish and wildlife. And I just wanna point out, it would be far more yellow if all marine species were listed here. So this is mostly terrestrial and some freshwater, not so much marine, like lionfish, not on this map. So imagine all that lovely blue being far more yellow. Now, the question usually is asked, so what? Is this just a bunch of green iguanas? Is this some brown anoles? Are these just some lizards that don't really cause a problem? And the, the public understanding, I don't think, is where we want it to be, right? We want the public to know more about what we're dealing with. For example, if we break down all these observations into how many species is it? No, it's not just brown anoles and green iguanas. It's over 500 verified non-native species. That's fish and wildlife that had to be introduced by humans, either accidentally or intentionally. It had to be, these species had to be introduced by us. So over 500 species have made it into the state. That's pretty significant. We have more non-native lizards in Florida then we have native lizards in Florida. Now, according to a literature review conducted by the agency and partners, at least 139 of these non-native species are reproducing, they are established. So that means it's not just a one and done kind of deal, right? It means that these animals were released, they were able to find a mate, breed successfully, have offspring and establish their population. And when an animal population is breeding, we know that means they may be able to increase their population density. That could impact our native wildlife. They may be able to increase their range. That could impact our native wildlife. These are all things that are big old red flags for a non-native biologist. Why are we so concerned about non-native species going invasive? Those non-native species that get a foothold and can breed and increase their range or population density. And it's because invasive species, as we all know, can really adversely impact our Florida ecology, our economy, our actual infrastructure of economics, and our human health and safety. And the reason why Florida is so susceptible to invasive species is a multitude of factors, but the three that I love focusing on that you're probably well aware of, there's a lot of access to our state. There are a lot of access points, ports of entry, where animals can come into our state and regularly come into our state through the live animal trade. In Florida, we have an enthusiastic live animal community. It's a very robust industry. And 
we know that our subtropical climate, which I adore in Florida, especially down here in South Florida, we know it's comparable to home ranges of many species on other continents. So if you think about the wild animals, that the live animals, I should say, that are in trade that come from South America, Africa, Asia, all of these continents, just as an example, have areas of subtropical climate. A species that thrives there, could easily thrive here. So that's a bit of a red flag when we're looking at how to analyze which species pose a risk. The way they're getting into Florida is exactly what you'd expect. It's unintentional some of the time, it happens. And that's why oversight at our ports is needed. We had the Javan mongoose introduced uh, into Port Everglades once, and of course he was trapped and removed. This is one of the most invasive mammals in the world. And this animal was part of a sugar shipment from the Caribbean, where he's also not native, which I think is sort of ironic. So these animals were introduced to control rats in sugar plantations decades ago, long, long, long before my time. And now they're still causing havoc in different continents. It's just wild to think about. But the unfortunate truth is the most common pathway isn't this unintentional hitchhiker. It's the escape or release of captive non-native species. And when I mean captive wildlife, I'm not talking about our zoos and our nature centers. I'm talking more about the commercial trade, our captive pet industry for non-native species and our commercial breeding and selling industries. They're not all bad, but we do know from that literature review that the most common documented pathway is the escape or the release of these animals. So our agency considers it a priority to identify high risk species and prevent their introduction. So we're almost to the pet amnesty side, and this is where it's really going to, I hope, if I do a good job, it's going to tie together. Because the way that the agency tries to be very proactive and preventative about introductions is to regulate and say, you can only do this or this or this with this species. So how are we going to do that? What is our criteria? And the criteria is, does this species pose an impact to our ecology, our economy, and human health and safety? So pause on that for a minute. If you think of animals in zoos, all captive wildlife is regulated, and usually it's regulated just by, can it kill you? Can it maybe kill you? Is it probably not going to kill you? And those are our class one, two, and three regulations. And that's a very generalized version of our captive wildlife regulations. What we're talking about now is completely different. Ecology, economy, and human health and safety. So there's a lot of different things lumped in there. And this is specific to non-native species, not just regular species like an American alligator, which would be native to our state. So when we regulate, we want to talk about activities that people can and can't do. If we're going to regulate, what can I do? What can I not do? So let's look at two classifications. For conditional species, this is a nutria. This species cannot be imported into the state and possessed as a pet. So if I'm Jan and I live in Kentucky and I own a nutria, as a wildlife pet, I can't move to Florida and bring my nutria with me. I'm gonna to have to rehome that little guy or gal so that I can move to Florida. The other things are allowed with permits. If we have something that's prohibited, that's our second category. And then we're looking at green anacondas. We're looking at large constrictors. Um, we're looking at a lot of uh, freshwater species that fall into some of these categories as well. So when you have a prohibited species, you cannot import it to the state and possess it as a pet, and you also can't breed it and commercially sell it. And putting restrictions on these types of activities limits the amount of animals that are possessed in our state and hopefully reduces that known entity of escape or release of non-native pets. Now, if we're going to throw the rule book at society and say you can and can't do this with a non-native species, then we decided, and I think this is so cool, this is where it gets fun, we decided we were going to give owners an alternative. So historically, what happened was back in 2006, a handful of large constrictor snakes like Burmese python, for example, they were proposed for regulation. Back then it was called reptiles of concern, ROC, reptiles of concern. It's changed since then. But back then when, when everyone was thinking, you know, 
if we regulate these animals and we say owners are going to be required to do stuff to possess them, like, for example, maybe get a permit, maybe put a pit tag, microchip in their animal, upgrade all their caging. If we throw the rule book, so to speak, at owners, we need to be prepared for them to react and maybe react unfavorably. And if they do, we don't want animals released. So what's the legal alternative? How do we give owners an option? If we're the lawmakers, how do we give them a legal out to avoid the release of their pets into the Florida ecosystem? And this is really cool. We can codify our program into law. And I think that's kind of nifty. It sounds boring. <laughs> I think it's cool. The rule book, the literal rule book where this law is contained, our rule is in the same chapter as all those regulations on the previous slide. It's part of Florida Administrative Code. And the reason why that's nifty is because the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission can propose and enact rule. So we can make rules that have the same weight as our Florida legislature. We can only do that for fish and wildlife resources, but we have that authority and extreme responsibility. So this is the first state, the first time a state was able to establish an amnesty program like this because of the way our wildlife agency is set up and has this great authority to make rule. So because we can make rules, we were able to say we can legally grant you amnesty from the rule. That's where it gets cool. Other states have reached out to us in the past to talk to us about our program and how effective it is or not effective in, in the hopes that they can establish it as well. So when they reach out, usually this is where we focus. And when we talk to the public, this is where we want to focus. What is it that we're trying to do? So all that history on non-native species, all that stuff we just talked about, about the rule book, that's all great. But what is it that the program is trying to accomplish? And the short answer is we want to provide pet owners. This is specific to pet owners. We want to provide them a legal and free alternative to releasing a non-native pet. If they're up against the wall and their choices are release or... I want them to have an or. That's what we're all about. But that's reactive. Let's add a proactive component. Let's educate them before they get a pet or let's educate them right after they get the pet, wherever we can get to the public and make sure they understand the pet that they've decided to possess or wish to acquire and possess may need more care than they're realizing at this stage. For example, this is a red-eared slider. And this cute itty bitty size is the size that pet stores used to sell them, sometimes still do in the state of Florida. This animal's not gonna remain the size, as you well know. It's going to grow up, it's going to get bigger. It's also long lived, several decades are possible. And the owner may not realize the filtration on an indoor system for an animal like this is extensive and costly. And they may or may not be aware or even able to provide it for the duration of this animal's life. That's where we come in. We need to step up our game and we need to provide education to the public on how to properly choose these animals and whether or not they require permits for possession. We can do both of these things and we should be able to help reduce the number of non-native species released into the wild in Florida. So now let's dive into how exactly does this program work? Sounds great on paper. How does it work? And it's very interesting. Non-native pets can be surrendered by an owner for any reason. It does not matter if suddenly they broke a hip and they can't get up the stairs to care for the snake that's in the cage upstairs, or if they just suddenly decided they don't want it anymore. Maybe it was the kid's pet, the kid moved off to college and mom and dad don't wanna deal with it. it. Does not matter. There is no reason that the, an the animal is possessed that, that we would turn that owner away. So whatever reason the owner wants to surrender, it's okay. This used to only happen in person at events. And this is pretty cool. You guys are familiar with exotic pet amnesty days. If you're in Florida, you've heard of them. We used to hold a handful of them every year throughout the state, different locations with partner host zoos or nature centers. And it's a fun, fair kind of festive activity. Surrenders happen in the morning. Adoptions happen in the afternoon. All the animals are examined by a volunteer veterinarian. It's a great, great event, but it has its drawbacks. They're costly 
because it's always costly to put on a fair style event. And owners had to wait. They had to wait until an event came anywhere near them. So year round operations was the way to go. Program started in 2006. By 2010, we were holding year round operations. And these operations happen three ways. Through the exotic species hotline, they can call and request surrender that way. They can go on myfwc.com. The exotic pet amnesty program has five different web pages on myfwc.com. So we have a surrender page, we have an adoptions page, we have a pet amnesty page, we have owner educational resources that we're constantly trying to update and add. And the surrender and adoption forms are there. They can be downloadable, they're fillable PDFs. And then all people have to do is submit those through our dedicated email account, which we also allow owners to contact us directly with questions and they can request a surrender form by email if they want to. All in all, all that has to happen is an owner needs to contact us, they get a surrender form and they submit it. It's that simple. So now we got to look at what happens next, because this is the part the public doesn't really know. And we want to get the word out there, but we really want our partners to have a good understanding of how this works, because it can be confusing. Our staff does not take possession of surrendered pets. There is no location anywhere in the state where the FWC accepts drop-offs. There is no brick and mortar humane society style, animal shelter style building, and we don't have staff that are trained to provide care. So how does this work? That seems like a big drawback, doesn't it? Let's look at it. Let's walk through it together. We get that surrender form. It comes through email to us, and then we begin our journey. We're going to facilitate the process from surrender to adoption. So surrender side first, the surrendering owner is going to be asked to continue to maintain possession and provide care. And we tell them that up front. And sometimes it's not an option for them, but most of the time when we explain what we're gonna do next, they calm down. So the surrendering owner continues possession and care and we'll give them an amnesty letter. It's an official FWC document, it provides them with all the legal amnesty they need. So if they were ever to be inspected, if they were transporting the animal to a new home, they're covered legally. We give them that because we need time. We need time to search our adopter database. This is a database that's already been built. All of our adopter applications, we've had hundreds. Currently we have well over 800 adopters statewide. They have filled out applications that demonstrate their knowledge of the species. They've also indicated the counties if, in which they're willing to go to and adopt an animal, and they've indicated the species that they would prefer to adopt. So we have all of that in the database, and all I have to do is type in chameleon in Broward County, and whatever adopters I have are going to pop up. So that is our asset. That's our bargaining chip with our owners to hang on, let us search. And then when we find one or three or six or 18 adopters, and sometimes it has been that many, when we find an adopter in the database, we give all that information to the owner and then we can step back. The owner and the new adopter will make the arrangements to physically transfer the pet to the new residents. And this also applies to out of state adoptions, which are becoming very, very common for any type of regulated species. So I'm gonna give you some highlights. This is from the program, program inception. We started in 2006, all the way through this month in 2021. Now, some of these highlights are interesting statistics. We're gonna look at some numbers, but not all of them are good numbers. Some of them represent challenges that my staff have to overcome. So in total, for the last 15 years, we've had nearly 6,900 animals surrendered all time. So what does that look like? Well, I thought you'd like it if I broke reptiles down into turtles and lizards and snakes, just so you could see how much turtles do actually make up our program. So we have quite a few reptiles surrendered to the program. It's over 60%. You can see that here. Of those all-time surrenders, more than 4,200 were non-native reptile surrenders. 
of those all-time surrenders, almost 2,500 were given at an exotic pet amnesty day. The rest came from the hotline and the email and the website. So you can see those assets acquired back in 2010 really helped. Year-round adoptions definitely outweighs the exotic pet amnesty days. And then of those all-time surrenders, we have received regulated species, well over a thousand, over 1,500 actually. That's conditional species and prohibited. And I'm sorry to tell you that that total number, that 1,515, over a thousand of those were red-eared sliders. I bet you're not surprised if you know anything about red-eared sliders in the pet trade and in Florida as far as invasive species go. So these are Numbers that are reality, they're not all bad, but we need to figure out more placement options. So before we do that, let me walk you through one or two scenarios so that we've digested all of the information regarding how surrenders work in our program. The folks that are eligible to surrender, all they need is a Florida address on their application. So we're not gonna totally background check them, we just, turn away anyone who calls us up from Connecticut or Georgia and says, I have this exotic pet. We're not gonna take that. You need to refer to your local state agency to find a solution. So Florida residents that are also in possession of a non-native pet. So what doesn't qualify as a pet? Well, if it's a domesticated species, cat, dog, hamster, guinea pig, pot-bellied pig, these are all considered domesticated animals. We don't accept those. We simply don't have the ability to handle that volume. So we refer owners to their local shelter. We don't accept native species. So raccoon, opossum, not a non-native species. It needs to be non-native to fall in the scope of our program. And we don't accept wild caught. So that's, this is more of a, hey, I found an iguana in my backyard. I've been feeding him for six weeks. That is not a pet, sir. So we're not gonna accept that animal. How long does it take? Oh, I wish I had a straight answer for you, but it varies. It's going to depend on the species surrendered. Is it desirable in the pet trade? Like an ivory ball python? That's easy to place. A green iguana? Not so easy. It's going to depend on the available number of adopters that have registered to be an adopter in the local area, and it's going to depend on those adopters and their interest level, as well as if the species is regulated, how many adopters possess the proper permit or can acquire it? What does the amnesty status actually give the owner? Full legal amnesty. So they don't have to pay any fee, even if they kept the animal illegally. And that means, let me see if I can explain it. If someone said, oh my God, I've had a Burmese python for the last 15 years and I didn't know it was a prohibited species in Florida as of this year, that's okay. That's okay. We, you can give it to us and you're not going to face any, you didn't break any laws. Just give it to us. You have amnesty. So they don't face a fee or legal ramifications. They also don't need to go get a permit while they're in our program. So they're sitting at home with their surrendered animal waiting for us to find them an adopter. They don't have to get a permit. They don't have to put a microchip, a pit tag in their animal. They don't have to upgrade their biosecurity caging. All they have to do is make sure it prevents escape. And then their amnesty status is going to last initially 90 days. And then we can renew it because some adoptions are going to take longer than 90 days. So we can grant more amnesty in 90 day increments as owners need it. All that means is the surrender of regulated species is really no different than the surrender of a non-regulated species. We accept conditional species like red-eared sliders. We accept prohibited species like Burmese pythons and Argentine black and white tegus pictured here. We accept those species just like they were a non-regulated species. Here's the problem. It's on the adoption side. Regulated species are only rehomed with approved adopters that are also permitted facilities. So that means a nature center or a zoological or aquarium type institution that has regular business hours and educational hours for the public and provides a regular service. They're the ones that can take regulated species. The one exception is the red-eared slider. This is a special, special species. It has its own conditional species permit and the general public can acquire that. So thank goodness for that. So Joe Q and Jane Q Public, if they hear this story and they're like, I wanna help, I like turtles, I think I could take on a slider, 
they can. Yay. Send them right to us. And what this means is that individual adopters, other than those wishing to adopt red-eared sliders, they cannot rehome conditional or prohibited species. So even those with the best intentions, I love snakes. I've had a Burmese python before. The prohibited species status means no new acquisition. So there are a limited number of approved adopters in the program that can take on these animals and rehoming these species is going to take some time. That's a challenge, as you can well see. On the surrender side, any year we have a big rule change. We had one this year. And it affected a lot of constrictors, it affected now monitors, but it really affected owners of green iguanas and tegus. Anytime we have a rule change, the species most affected, we're going to get a high volume of those species surrendered, and we're not going to have very many options. We're also always going to have a high volume of less desirable pet trade non-native species like red-eared sliders. If we look on the adoption side of the house, there is a constant never ending need to recruit private individuals as adopters. We need hundreds every year. We can never have enough. And we also need to recruit more permitted exhibitor adopters as well as recruit out of state adopters because our state rules stop at the state border. So a private individual could adopt a tegu, a Burmese python out of state as long as their state doesn't regulate it. The other thing that we need to do is we need to be really fun and modern and spiffy in the way that we tell our exotic pet amnesty program conservation story. It is the coolest program out there and it's not perfect, but we can tell our story and get people to go, oh, I didn't realize I can take action. I can be part of this. So let's talk about some solutions. We want to adapt the traditional table style outreach. You go to an event, there are tables and vendors there and they have these brochure displays. Well, COVID kind of messed that up because we didn't really have many events or tables. So we're getting back into that now, but we need to adapt and get modern. So what we want to do is partner with zoos, aquariums, nature centers, any place that has the infrastructure to have guest traffic, visiting guest traffic, or has a widely known presence in the community. What would that do for our program? Let me tell you, we want to explore social media options. So we're talking about cross posting. So we have social media. FWC is trendy. We're hip. We Facebook, we Insta, we even tweet. We're doing everything we can, but we want to try to share our content. So what we've done is we've written the content. You guys don't have to do it. We've done it. So we have content ready to go into member magazines and newsletters, email blasts, anything that any of these entities that have a lovely good sized following and they have a following of nature minded conservation focused members of the public. We need them. So we'll send you the stuff. All you got to do is repost it. And we'll also take those old school to go displays and we're going to give them to you to go. It's free. We want to find partners and not just our zoos and nature centers and rehabilitators and aquariums. We're also talking about vendors that may be conservation minded. Maybe they donate. Maybe they're a brewery or a t-shirt shop, but they're conservation minded and they want to take action. We need our content in their shops so that the foot traffic, the public can see it. What we do is we offer these for free. We already have them. We have all the brochures. We have them. They can go in gift shops. They can go in education corners of any of these entities that might become our partners. We can not only increase our non-native species reports. So you see that little yellow card in the photo. That is a how to report non-native species. You just slap it up on your fridge with a cute little magnet and you know exactly what to do. You, the member of the public, can take action anytime you cite a non-native species. And the FWC relies on those reports. The second thing is these displays promote program awareness. So not only do we get to recruit adopters from zoo guests, the general public, nature centers, anywhere where the word is getting out, but we also get to promote the message of don't let it loose. It's illegal to release 
non-native species in the state of Florida. What are your options? And the last thing we can do is give educational talking points to zoo ambassadors, nature center ambassadors, nature center staff. We already made these talking points. It's a couple page document of just the take home, take away messages that people should know about our program. And we need to share these. And I'll give you an example. I spent about eight years working for SeaWorld and I was a zoological ambassador. I was one of the ones walking around with a monkey or a sloth or some kind of display animal. And I used to talk about rainforest safe products because most of our animals were from the rainforest. And I used to talk about shark conservation because I was a shark trainer for many years. So these are great things to talk about, but I wish I had known what our own state was doing. I wish I had known about this program because folks don't want to hear the negative about non-native species. They don't want to hear the negative about what's going on in the environment. They want to know what the problem is and what they can do to be part of the solution. So that's really where we've landed is we want any of these entities, any of the members of the public, Anyone who works for a library, a school, a nature center, a zoo, we want you to contact us if this sounds interesting. We've got all this material. We need an audience to give it to. So you can always reach us through the Exotic Species Hotline and our dedicated email account. These are available to you even if it's not about social media content or to-go brochure boxes. This is available to you if you just have questions. I'm not sure if this is a pet amnesty situation. No problem. Call us up. Email us. We'll chat it out. And we want you to know us, the two biologists that run this program, Taylor and myself, we want you to directly email us. We want you to have our cell phone numbers to give out, to use, so that we can talk you through special situations, perhaps give you options, and coordinate to find the best possible solution to any animal surrender. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and take any questions you guys may have. Okay. 